the Elizabeth Islands, an unspoiled chain of land dividing Buzzards Bay from Vineyard Sound. For half a century, these islands have been the cruising grounds for the Concordia yawl. In 1988, a fleet of these classic wooden yachts returned to Buzzards Bay to celebrate 50 years of sailing. The Concordia is one of the most enduring yacht designs in sailing history. She has collected as many trophies as any class in ocean racing history, and yet the Concordia has also shown that a winning boat can be beautiful and comfortable to sail. Her design is as timeless as it is beautiful. A design that relies not on high-tech solutions, but on the simplicity and integrity of time-tested values. In all, 103 Concordia yawls were built between 1938 and 1966. Today, all 103 are still afloat. And on the 50th anniversary of the boat's design, owners, sailors, and admirers have gathered here in Peyton Aram, Massachusetts home of the Concordia Yawl. <laughs> They're lovely boats. They're, they're just uh, sweethearts to sail. They are very uh, sea kindly. Uh, they're reasonably fast for their size. And they're very comfortable. They're just good boats. And, uh, they're probably the prettiest boats that were ever, ever built. I got a call once that a man named Jenkins was selling his Concordia. And I called the yard and talked to them and told them over the phone that I'd buy the boat. I quit my job, bought a one-way ticket to Boston, took a bus to New Bedford, and got a cab to the yard and stepped aboard. And I was $17,000 in debt. I was unemployed, but I had a boat. We like the design. We like the, the workmanship below decks and everywhere. The workmanship is what absolutely sold the boat on us. A lot of people say, oh, but it's so cramped. I said, not when you get used to it. Anything is cramped <laughs> till you get used to it. <laughs> It's a class like no other. The fact that there were 103 of them built, um, that they were owned by a devoted group, um, among whom were the best ocean racers and best sailors of the era, and the fact that every single one of them is still sailing makes them completely unique in one design boat. Well, I like to think it's a very unusual situation because most uh, designers are anxious to get on with something new and, and better, or maybe to uh, better adjust to a certain man-made rule. But these boats uh, have uh, all been made with the idea of making it as simple to handle and yet efficient as far as uh, sailing is concerned. Waldo Howland established the Concordia Company over 50 years ago, just down the hill from his family's house in Peyton Aram. Well, this spot has been home for me for 80 years now. The pine and the locust that went into the house is the entire uh, feature of the Concordia Yall. Inside the house, the uh, pine is attractive and uh, uh, has a nice soft color. And outside, if you oil it and don't uh, paint it, uh, 
there's no problem in the upkeep. I'm sure that the folks in the old days had certain uh, basic principles that they followed, and if we followed in the same way, uh, we're going to get the same uh, uh, type of building that people today uh, seem to be, in a way, starved for. The Howland family has been connected to the sea for generations. Waldo Howland's ancestors were among the leading merchants in nearby New Bedford's whale fishery when that industry dominated coastal New England in the 19th century. New Bedford's prosperity led Peyton Aram to expand from a farming and fishing village to a shipbuilding town. The decline of commercial whaling at the end of the 19th century coincided with an increase in yachting as New Bedford's swelling leisure class returned annually to their summer colonies dotting the shores of Buzzards Bay. The Concordia is part of this second chapter in Peyton Aram's history. Waldo describes himself as being boat-minded from the beginning. As a boy, he explored the shores of Peyton Aram Harbor. Later, he ventured into Buzzards Bay on board his father Llewellyn's Norwegian pilot boat, Escape. For Waldo, distant memories of whale ships and a life at sea were kept alive by his father, whose chronicles of New England life filled the pages of Atlantic magazine. Nowhere and no when has there been contrived an institution of learning more richly endowed or more efficient than that New England shore farm. Here I learned to swim, to sail a boat, to work with tools and to know ash from oak and of more consequence than all these arts and many more to feel I was doing my part in a vitally important work. Waldo inherited from his father a knowledge of the traditions of ocean life, the solid understanding of which would shine through so clearly in the Concordia Yawl. It came without warning, packing winds up to 130 miles per hour and unleashing devastating tidal floodwaters. On the afternoon of September 21st, the Great Hurricane of 1938 hit the New England coast with disastrous effect. The morning after, residents of Peyton Aram came down to the harbor to sort through the wreckage. Llewellyn Howland's Norwegian pilot boat, Escape, lay silently against the rocks of the town causeway, her starboard side completely crushed. For Llewellyn Howland, it was a painful loss. My father, he said, well, this is the end. I won't have any more boats. I can't stand it. But in a few months, as might be expected, he was back to thinking boats again. Llewellyn turned to his son Waldo and a young designer named Ray Hunt to build a new boat, Java. Little did they know that Java would become the prototype for 103 Concordia yawls. And it started in uh, Boston, 150 State Street. Ray Hunt and I uh, rented a small place there and did a very small business during the uh, Depression days. We uh, sold used boats and sold a few uh, new designs, things went, went well for California in the very beginning. New commissions came slowly in the early years. In 1935, Ray Hunt designed the 30-foot sloop We Pecket, launched that year from the Casey Boatyard in Fairhaven. Other designs followed. Victoria, the 62-foot schooner built for Hendon Chubb, True to her name, Victoria took the Astor Cup only months after being launched. With her graceful, sheer, and elegant lines, she looked very much like her younger sisters, the Concordia Yawls. Her design was unmistakably Ray Hunt. C. Raymond Hunt was in a class with the great yacht designers of this century. 
Ray Hunt is an interesting character. He was a genius, he was, and he lived a life that was so disorganized that he never was able to cash in on any of his genius. Ray Hunt designed and in invented and designed the Deep V powerboat hull, and every single powerboat today uses his design. He also designed the Boston Whaler, for which he received $850 as a design fee. I probably first met Ray Hunt uh, back in, right after World War II, and we were associated together in business for a couple of years, uh, 1950 to 52, in sail making, and got to know him pretty well through uh, experimenting in boats, testing them, and ideas of whether he thought it was good or bad, what was a fast sail and what wasn't. You know, we vented the cross-cut spinnaker, I think it was in 52, on a 210. So it got me going in the sail business. So. Ray's education in, in naval architecture was practically nothing. I'm sure he worked with other naval architects in, in their firms for a while and learned by that, but had no formal training. He wasn't a draftsman type of designer. He had other people do that. He'd just come up with the ideas and say, here, go build it. And sometimes you have to figure out how to build. Sometimes he designed something a little hard to build. Had to work around that. Hunt produced a variety of innovative sail and powerboat designs. After the Concordia, he introduced the high-performance 110 and 210 day sailors, whose box-like plywood hulls were more akin to today's racers than the Depression-era catboats and dinghies. In addition to his sailboat designs, Hunt was responsible for two of the most significant powerboat developments of the century, the Deep V hull and the Boston Whaler. The first V-hulls were remarkable for their ability to maintain high speeds in choppy seas. Sea Blitz, launched in 1950, was clocked at 60 miles per hour on a midwinter afternoon in Boston Harbor. In 1955, Dick Fisher asked Hunt to design a boat which could be put into production using a new, unsinkable, solid foam hull. The result was the first Boston Whaler. In 1958, Hunt sketched out plans for a new 12-meter to bid for the first America's Cup defense since World War II. She was called Easterner. A Hunt designed one of the new boats, Easterner which I think was the first 12 meter that was a long, extra long boat with heavy displacement. Not unlike a Concordia, it was the first of that breed. It was a shame that, you know, the funds weren't there to build the boat as well as it should have been and maintain it and outfit it. But in a way, it was probably a different and almost a breakthrough boat for its day, but it didn't have everything else going for it. It had bur bursts of speed that uh, at times that were, you know, really exceptional. On board Vim, one of the other challenges in the 58 Cup trials was Dick Bertram. Bertram saw one of Hunt's V hulls ferrying crew to Easterner. He approached Hunt and asked him to design a larger version for the upcoming Miami to Nassau powerboat race. But it was here at the Bertram Yacht Company that the most exciting story of the 1960 Miami Nassau race had its beginning. It was the story of a boat with a revolutionary hull design. This was Moppy, developed by Bertram from a design by Ray Hunt. She featured a unique bow to transom V hull to give a soft ride and rough going. The strakes, or longitudinal steps, were designed to provide lift and reduce wetted surface. Moppy proved in a hurry she was in her element, staying on profile in an amazing demonstration of sea keeping ability. For Bertram, the deep V was a godsend. For Ray Hunt, it was just another good idea. Ray was not a businessman. He, was, he couldn't be bothered with that. He just went on from one thing to another, developing things, and he'd disappear from business. He can go off to the woods or go out sailing by himself when he's supposed to be in business. He didn't design that many boats, that's the problem. But somebody who knows who he was and knows about Easterner and the 110s and 210s and the Deep V Hull know that he was an incredible genius and one of the greatest yacht designers we've ever had. I would say one of the reasons that Ray Hunt never 
really got well known through his whole career was because he probably was a little too far ahead of his time in many of the things he did. I suppose it's like a, an artist that doesn't get known too long after he's gone. The elder Howland commissioned Ray and Waldo to design a boat that could be handled easily in the choppy waters of Buzzards Bay, and he wanted a boat that was fast. The result? Java, a yawl that stands apart in yachting history for its unique combination of a cruiser's seaworthiness and the speed of an open ocean racer. It was a practical idea because my father had had the experience. He knew what he wanted. It was designed nicely with uh, speed in mind because Ray, Ray Hunt understood what made a boat go and knew that Father wanted to have it go and wanted to get out to uh, the islands and back as quick as anybody. Right where the white changes to green here, uh, it's a hard turn. Instead of a round turn, it's quite hard, square. And from that point down to the uh, keel, it's almost a straight line. It isn't full. And the fact that you have the balanced end so that you can rock comfortably, and the fact that you don't have a, uh, quite a fat bottom but a straight one allows the water to slide through very uh, uh, easily, which means the boat can go uh, a little faster. The house is designed as carefully as the uh, bottom of the boat in order that sitting at the helm, you can see the water without standing up. It doesn't protrude in, in your line of vision, and that in itself makes it more fun to uh, sail. It was a good all-round boat. It wasn't too deep a draft. It had uh, fairly full bow, fairly narrow stern. A very symmetrical boat, more like a fish. The fact that it wasn't extreme in any way, it was just a good all-round boat, it made it very successful. The Concordia's design was influenced by the new generation of ocean racing yachts, which in the 1930s were beginning to replace the larger gaff-rigged schooners and sloops. Ocean racing did not begin in earnest until the beginning of this century. The early Bermuda and transatlantic ocean racers were based upon traditional working sailboats, such as the Gloucester fishing schooner with wide beam and gaff rig. John Alden's Malabar schooners were typical of this type. Smaller designs, more similar to the Concordia, made their appearance in the 1930s. Of these, the most influential was Olin Stevens' Dorade, which borrowed many of its features from the day racing meter classes. Features such as tall, lightweight, Marconi rigs and narrow beam. Critics thought these designs too tender for the open sea, but by the 1950s, smaller yachts like the Concordia were the boats to beat in offshore racing. Each year, the New York Yacht Club sponsors an ocean race that brings out the really big fellows, the super sloops, yawls, and schooners of the Atlantic seaboard. These larger racing craft compete under a complicated handicap system. Length at the waterline and the area of sail are the main factors in determining who gets a head start over whom. The Cruising Club of America introduced its first ocean racing handicap rule in 1934, four years before the Concordia was designed. 
many naval architects sought to take advantage of loopholes in these rules, but Howland and Hunt stuck to the basic goal of designing a fast, practical sailboat. It was designed to no, no racing rule whatsoever. It's uh, unique in that respect. And it was just designed uh, to be obedient to the uh, verities of good naval architecture. The way I feel is that always racing rules pretty much control uh, the design of boats. It isn't that all people race, but those that just want cruising or uh, day sailing and all are influenced by uh, winning racing boats. And I, I think this, it's a poor trend because it uh, limits what the architects can do to design a uh, new boat. Some people design boats extreme for a particular rule of the day and it doesn't last too long. This boat probably wasn't designed to a rule. It was just designed as a good offshore sailing boat. In fact, it didn't have extremes. So it went through the test of time. Many of today's fiberglass ocean racers with their rule-beating and weight-saving design lack the Concordia's seaworthiness, comfort, and versatility. She's very sea-kindly, and that's the difference. That's where you get into the difference between these fiberglass boats and, uh, and a, a yacht like this. And uh, I, race a, uh, I race a CNC 39, and we pound her to death and she's she's wonderful and uh, I just wouldn't want to go down below and and make a long passage and enjoy myself with her because that's what this boat is to me they don't have any of the bad habits that a lot of the new boats have which have been designed to a rule which has caused them to be very beamy uh, very high-sided very low in displacement uh, a divided underbody uh, that uh, allows them to spin out. When you heel over the stern lifts out of the water and the boat rounds up, you have to have a big crew sitting on the stern and on the rail. Whereas the Concordia was symmetrical, when it heeled over, the helm didn't change. Who wants to sit out with your feet hanging over the uh, side of the boat all the time? It's, and it doesn't make sense. Although the Concordia was not specifically designed to a racing rule, the class has won a staggering number of ocean racing victories. In 1954, the Concordia Melee became the smallest boat ever to win the Bermuda race, the oldest and most prestigious of international ocean races. In 1978, the Concordia took the Bermuda race again, marking one of the longest winning streaks in ocean racing history. Dan Strohmeyer went out and won, won the Bermuda race that year. The way Waldo found out about it was that his father, Llewellyn, who was rather old then, called him on the phone and said, come over immediately. And Waldo came running up and his father said, she won, she's done it, boy, she won the Bermuda race. The finale was the awarding of prizes at a cocktail party at the Prince's Hotel Saturday afternoon. First, Dan Strohmeyer received the prizes won by Melee. There were five different trophies all together. Needless to say, it took four of Dan's crew members to help him carry the silverware off the platform. That same year, Actea won the Storm Trisel race. And so then, you went immediately to 55. Actea won the Annapolis uh, Newport race, and Ray Hunt won six out of six races in Cows Week, all in the same year. And everybody just said, well, <laughs> he started ordering them. When Henry Sears became Commodore of the New York Yacht Club, his Concordia Actia became the club's smallest flagship ever, signaling the widespread acceptance of the Concordia class. We had uh, Commodores of uh, almost uh, all the harbors up and down the uh, New England coast and uh, into New York it was a time when owners of some uh, uh, note were coming to uh, smaller boats rather than larger ones. 
Yachting was continually changing. In the late 1800s, it was mainly very large sailing yachts crewed entirely by professionals and steered by professionals. And gradually that changed where owners became more and more interested in sailing their own boats. And they wanted a boat that they could sail with fewer crew. I don't think it was strictly economic. I think people, people were changing. People were getting into different types of sports. They were starting to do downhill skiing. They were becoming more and more outdoorsy, generally. And um, one of the things they wanted to do was go sailing with a wife and kids, you know. And in order to do that, you had to have a boat like a Concordia. Oh, eight years ago, or oh, eight to ten years ago, uh, ladies sailing at Manchester Yacht Club was very active. We had two extremely uh, good women skippers. And uh, I'd take Crocodile, and we'd have uh, another two or three other people. And all women crew, and we would go uh, up to Boston Harbor and then pick up a mooring down in Hull, all prearranged for uh, the night, and then uh, sail back again. From a single boat intended only for one man's use, Java became the model for a class of 103 yawls. I greatly admired his father's Java. And, uh, and I asked Waldo what, what he thought it might cost to build one. He said, well, my friend Drady Cochran is having one built right now at Abbeking in Rasmussen in Germany. And we should know the answer very shortly. Drayton Cochran had a very uh, close connection with Abbeking and Rasmussen because they had built for him several large vessels. He uh, financed the first few Concordia yawls because uh, we sold the first one immediately when it got here and then we took over the whole operation. Abbeking and Rasmussen was considered one of the finest shipbuilding yards in the world. In all, they produced 99 of the 103 boats in the Concordia class. Concordias were built at Abbeking in a real production line style. And we really know quite a lot about it because they took photographs of the boats as they were being built and Concordia paid them in stage payments. You know, they just, they set up the keel and they dropped the frames down. They were all pre-assembled frames. And the deck houses were built independently. And as soon as the boat was ready for it, um, it would be dropped on. One of the n nicest things about the boats is that they're tight seams. The planking does not have caulking in it at all. And that allows them to be very, very fair. The um, backbone and structural wood in the boat is oak white oak, and the planking is African mahogany, which is really nice wood. The deck house is Philippine mahogany. There's no doubt about it that uh, <coughs> Abbeking and Rasmussen was one of the best yards in the world. There were, there were of course, Nevins back in the United States, Camper and Nicholson over in England, but it just so happened that right after the war, the only one that was really in uh, business and prepared to do work for uh, a very modest sum was uh, Abbeking and Rasmussen. They had the men uh, from before the war, and they also had saved materials, had hi hidden them uh, uh, during the war so that they could start uh, building again. They were not sympathetic to the Nazis, and they took all their best wood and ran off in the forest and hid it in a swamp, and uh, about half of it was out there. And uh, Herman Shadlow, who runs the yard now, said, yeah, and they found that, and they left the wood that we had in our shed alone, so it serves us right. The boats were uh, loaded as deck cargo on these big freighters in Bremen, 
and um, sometimes there are many, as many as five on one big ship. From Boston, the boats were towed through the Cape Cod Canal to the Concordia shipyard in Peyton Arum for final fitting out. We never had a contract with them, and we never had an argument with them. Their object was to build good boats for us, and our object was to keep in the, their good graces and send them good money. And this system went on for, as I say, 15 years and uh, 99 boats. Waldo carefully controlled the expansion of the Concordia class, frequently turning down suggestions that the design be changed and avoiding the construction of boats on spec. Among other things, a lot of people said, well, I'd like a bigger one, I'd like such and such, I'd like a different rig. And Waldo adhered to what he had done rigidly. He's just unrelenting in his pursuit of perfection. And in a sense, he can be very rigid about it and tough. And without that part of him, those boats would never have turned out so well. A good boat, well tuned up, is very hard to beat. And neither the wind, nor the waves, nor human beings do much changing. So that if you once have a good boat, the people that really enjoy sailing and do it for their own pleasure and not for some commercial reason, uh, they're going to be buying this boat. This yard has always been uh, to, to take care of uh, wooden boats because wood is what I like to work with and uh, they've carried on with that uh, in spite of uh, various new materials. The Concordia Company has always catered to, to wooden boats, what with the Concordia yawls and the Beetle Cat boats. And, uh, they have a crew that understands wood, and uh, I'm hope, hoping that that will mean that the Concordia Yalls will continue to come here. Many of the best carpenters, or mechanics as you call anybody that can do well with, uh, with their hands, enjoy working on wood uh, rather better than some other materials. It's, it's a more pleasant type of work. It's easier to love a wooden boat perhaps, than it is any other uh, construction. It's hard to explain why a person likes uh, a nice uh, mahogany table in their dining room, but they do. There are certain niceties that uh, wood furnishes, and uh, it always will. I had put together a very elaborate and fancy 50th anniversary book and have a big, huge shindig. We sailed over, motored and sailed, I guess, to Pedernarum together. And in Pedernarum, there were many, many, many more boats. There were 35 boats there also. And we came in sort of in formation. And everybody was honking their horns, and, and it was just terrific. So we were rafted in the basin, we squeezed so many Concordias into South Wharf. It was amazing how they were stacked in there. And you really were, had a demonstration of what good boat handlers everybody is in the class. Concordia Safari. Safari. Can we just drop the mooring and we'll be milling around now also. Sounds good. We raced on uh, Saturday, and there were, I think we had 67 boats racing, as I recall. And we had a spinnaker class and a non-spinnaker class, and we got them all tangled up by designing the courses so they'd be together. 
started out very light and fluky and filled in as it often does and does its best. It's wonderful fun to see them all coming back and uh, looking as good as new and in many cases better than new. It just gives you a lift when you think that there are so many uh, good sailors that really treasure their Concordia yawls. It is very interesting that after 50 years that almost every Concordia that was built is still around and in pretty good condition. I think it's the boat and the owners of the boats are, you know, sort of historically oriented, uh, interested in a well-built wooden boat and the character of the boat, which was sort of an old-fashioned yacht type of thing, but still a good boat to go sailing in today. Easy to sail, not a complicated boat to sail. So that everyone's really kept them up and uh, probably no other class like it or any other boat that's been that popular for so long. In order to have a long-lasting class, it is important to have a uh, good design. If it's worked out so that it'll fit the wind and the wave, it'll be symmetrical, uh, double-ended, uh, stable, all those things. That's what makes beauty. The proportions are right. The Concordia sprung from a design process and a philosophy of building, which is less and less common in today's world. For Waldo Howland, form truly followed function. <laughs>